Thank you all so much for coming, especially those who have come from far away. Uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I have the privilege of going first today, so I get everyone's full attention, so I think that's pretty cool. So I spent my 5.30 in the Hanson lab, and in the Hanson lab, we look at stem cell regulation, and to do that, we make use of C. elegans as a model organism. So today, I'm going to be telling you guys about this novel protein interaction that we found that we think is pretty cool uh, for regulating stem cells. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, what is a stem cell? So a stem cell basically is this population of unspecialized cells that have the capacity to give rise to a wide variety of cell types. Uh, over here, don't bother reading all this, but the point is to emphasize that there are many therapeutic applications of stem cells, which makes them a very interesting uh, cell population to study. So stem cell regulation. So one of the choices that stem cells need to make that's very critical to their development is whether or not the stem cell stays as a stem cell or differentiates towards a committed fate. So to illustrate this concept to you, I have my favorite model organism, Dan the undergrad here. <laughs> and Dan the undergrad has two choices. He can either self-renew and stay as a student and stay in school, or he can differentiate down a committed career path. And so this is a very difficult choice. So I really empathize with stem cells because they also have a difficult choice if they want to self you, proliferate, or if they want to differentiate towards a committed cell fate. And so to study this balance, we use C. elegans as a model organism in the Hansen lab. And specifically, we use the C. elegans germline. So this is a very powerful model organism. As you can see, it's transparent. It has a nice, large gonad to look at. Uh, it has a fast generation time. You can look at lots of worms quickly. And it's kind of adorable. So all those make it a really attractive model organism. <laughs> So here we have our C. elegans, and here we have our germline in the C. elegans. So zooming in, hopefully what you can appreciate here is that the gonad is kind of set up in this factory assembly line sort of format, all right? So here at the distal end, these green circles, those are your stem cells, that's your mitotic pool of stem cells. And they're maintained by this yellow thing called the distal tip cell. And so the distal tip cell is giving some sort of signal to tell those nearby cells stay as stem cells. And as you move away from that, you get this gradient of differentiation. So by the end, at the proximal end here, you've got differentiated cells, sperm and oocytes. And so this distal tip cell here is giving some sort of signal. So these cells, they stay as stem cells, and then as you move away, you start to differentiate. So that signal is actually not signaling straight out of CMMB403. And so the NOx receptor in uh, the Cialinus germline is called GLP1, so GLP1 not signaling. And so that's giving a proliferation signal. And that exists in a gradient. So as you move away from this distal tip cell here, that signaling starts to go down. And in its place, you get the gold pathways kind of taking over. So the pathway uh, that we know of so far is we have glip one not signaling, so that proliferation signal, stem cell stays as stem cells. And through some intermediary gene pathways, that's inhibiting the gold pathways, uh, which are uh, the two main ones I'll be talking about are gold one and gold two, and they're encouraging differentiation. So really what's happening is you have these opposing gradients of stem cell fate uh, that kind of help a cell decide if it wants to stay as a stem cell or differentiate. So that's kind of been well characterized. That's what we know right now. We have this pathway. We have flip one here, intermediary genes, and then that inhibits uh, the gold pathway genes. But what recent data in our lab has shown is that besides this, there's also some sort of potential protein interaction. And this is really cool because it's a direct protein interaction between GLP1, the NOx receptor, and the gold proteins. And so they're far away genetically, but for some reason they're coming together physically to interact. And so that's really what my project is going to be looking at. I'm going to be looking at uh, what the purpose of that interaction is. So my first aim is very simply confirm the presence of that protein interaction. Does it exist? My second aim is going to be taking that protein and then breaking it down using truncations to see exactly where that interaction is taking place. Okay, so to do that, I'm gonna take a step away from worm and into yeast. So to look at protein interaction, I'm gonna be using this system called yeast2 hybrid. And this is a very powerful system for looking at protein interactions. Uh, basically, you have your one protein of interest, so in this case, GLP1, the NOSH receptor, and you couple that to the GAL4 activating domain. So GAL4 is a yeast transcription factor. And then you couple your other protein of interest to the GAL4 binding domain. And so only, and only if there's an interaction between those two proteins of interest, if they're, if they're able to interact, 
you're gonna be able to turn on the gout promoter to drive expression of downstream genes. And so very simply, all you need to know to understand this is if the yeast grow, that makes me happy. If the yeast does not grow, I'm not as happy, all right? Okay, so here's the protocol I follow. So here we have the genes from the worm, the three genes I'm looking at. So I truncate them by PCR, and then I clone them into the yeast to hybrid vectors, and then I transform the yeast with those vectors. So the yeast are now able to express my two proteins of interest. I then spot the yeast onto selection plates, uh, and then as an added step, I also do different dilutions of yeast just to try to gauge how strong of an interaction there is. So this is the protocol that I'm gonna be following. So the last thing you need to know before I get to my results is how did I select how to make those protein truncations? So here I have a schematic of GOLD1 and GOLD2, those two proteins. And so really I've just taken each and chopped them into three based off what was previously found in the literature. And here I've highlighted some important domains which may or may not be important later. Spoiler alert, they will be important later. Uh, so yeah, that's, those are my truncations. And so let's take a look. So we're gonna start with GOLD1. So again, I have that schematic up here of GOLD1. But before we get to truncations, let's make sure the full-length GOLD1 is interacting. So here's full-length GOLD1, and here's GLIP1, and it looks like the yeast are growing, so that's, that's good, that's pretty good, but it looks like we got trouble in my negative control, which is an empty vector, so GOLD1 alone, the yeast for some reason is also growing, which doesn't make any sense, there's probably some background interaction or whatever, so this result we can't trust for sure. So let's get to the first truncation, this dimerization region here, the first 100, 1 to 205 amino acids. And this is much better, this makes me happy, it looks like it's interacting, nice, clean, negative control background. Okay, cool. Second truncation, doesn't seem to be any interaction. Third one, at first glance, it's like, oh yay, but again, we have that problem where there's some background showing up in the negative control, so we don't know if that's real or not. Okay, so for gold one, it really seems like this dimerization domain, that's kind of the important domain. Okay, so now let's move to gold two, same thing. Here's our schematic here, so starting with full length, it looks like we have a nice, clean interaction. These results are much better, I guess. Uh, nice, clean, ne negative control in all the truncations, and it's very clear, uh, very clearly we have this region that's interacting, and that happens to be the germline-specific region of gold two. And I'll tell you what that, what that means later. So. Uh, in both these cases, it happens to be the N-terminal domain of both these proteins. So for GOLD1, this first 1 to 205 amino acids, this dimerization region. For GOLD2, it's this germline-specific region that seems to be doing the interacting. Okay, so that's great. That was the first aim. We found the interaction. And the second aim is really going to be breaking it down, seeing where that interaction is taking place. So we're literally going to use PCR. We're going to break it down some more. So here's gold one, here's that dimerization domain that I told you about, and we're gonna cut it right in half, and we're gonna see if either one of those halves is able to interact. So for gold two, we're gonna get just a little bit fancier. So I've done these kind of overlapping truncations, and I've done this just to really try to capture where exactly along this protein the interaction is taking place. Okay, so let's get to the, the result, results for that. So don't ignore gold two for now, let's start with gold one. So we've cut this dimerization domain in half, and it doesn't look like there's any yeast growing, so it doesn't look like there's any sort of interaction happening there. So at this time, it seems to be the dimerization domain is as low as we can go. For gold two, it's a little bit more interesting. Of all those overlapping truncations, these four uh, are the most interesting. So starting with the first, just taking the first 100 amino acids, doesn't seem like there's any interaction, okay? For the first 200, it looks like we have maybe something happening. Uh, for the first 300, we see some interaction, and for the first 400, again, we have that interaction. So it seems like at this time, we're able to narrow it down right uh, to one of 300. All right, so we've got gold two narrowed down a little bit more. Okay, so for gold one, we've got it down to one to 205. For gold two, we have it down to the first 300. And of course, we need glip one for interaction with gold one, gold two. So I've been saying gold one, gold two a lot. What, what does this actually mean? What does this look like in the worm? So let's take a look. So for gold one, gold one is actually an mRNA binding protein, all right? So it binds mRNAs in the three prime UTR region, and it binds the mRNAs that are important for self renewal. So by binding those and repressing those, it's promoting differentiation that way. And so importantly, gold one binds as a dimer, all right? And it needs to bind as a dimer in order to function. And so as you can imagine, if GLIP1 is interacting with the dimerization domain, that could be interfering with gold one's dimerization, which might be affecting its activity somehow. 
Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. And Gold 2, so Gold 2 is a poly A polymerase. Uh, this happens to be my personal favorite polymerase because I also like it when I get A's added to my transcript. But it gets <laughs> A's added and it stabilizes transcripts that are important for differentiation. And so it also promotes differentiation that way. Uh, so there are actually many different isoforms of Gold 2 in the world that we don't need to worry about. But uh, for this project, it's interesting that GLP1 seems to be interacting with the germline specific region. So this isoform of Gold 2 is only found in the germline. So that uh, makes it seem like it could be a germline specific effect. So this is kind of what's happening uh, in terms of what the proteins actually are doing. And so coming back to the bigger picture, the overall model, here we have our beautiful opposing gradient system. And so what I'm proposing is that this model or novel protein interaction uh, exists to quickly establish and maintain these opposing gradients of stem cell fate. And so that uh, kind of influences how a stem cell decides if it's gonna stay as a stem cell or differentiate. So future directions, I wanna take this project in. Uh, I've got the region really narrowed down, but it'd be really nice to show exactly which amino acids are doing the interacting. Uh, so I'm currently doing a these two hybrid mutagenesis stream to try to uh, get at that. Uh, this has all been done in yeast, which is really good, but it'd be really cool to show the interaction in the worm. Uh, so we do have some initial results for an in vivo protein interaction, but we definitely need to build on that. And so also in that line, uh, it would be a cool experiment to make CRISPR mutants that have some sort of compromised protein interactivity and kind of see what kind of phenotypic effects uh, might exist because of that. All right, so that was my project. I'd like to thank the Hansen Lab for all their support. It's been great. Special thanks to the Sandberg Lab for their help with yeast. And yeah, thank you for coming.